So let us pray over tonight, uh, this morning's message. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. I want to bring myself, Lord, to subjection, Lord God, before your throne of grace. Lord God, there has been a, a trying week for Christian and I, Lord God, but we, we want to get rid of all this junk. We want to leave it, Lord, at the door, Father. We just want to come to you, Lord God, as, a, as believers in Christ Jesus, come and worship the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord God, I pray, Father, right now, myself, as I stand here, I am so small. Lord God, I am so small to you, Father. I just pray, Lord God, that you will just get me out of the way. As John says, let me decrease as you increase. Lord God, let your, let your words, Lord God, let your words be the words that flow from my mouth. Lord God, may you be glorified and exalted. May the fragrance that is in the bowl as we praise you, Lord God, be pleasing to your nostrils. Lord God, we just thank you. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share with you guys a story before we get into this. And I've told this story before to other people. I have an older brother. Some people know that. He's four years older than me. And when you grew up in Denham Springs, anybody know where that is? Denham Springs? Oh, you got some. All right, cool. All right, so I grew up there, and I had a tough childhood. My parents were constantly fighting. I first heard the word divorce when I was probably about four. And it got oftentimes uh, our house, our apartment complex, you could see the, the fruits of the arguments and things in there where there were holes in the sheetrock and, and things like that. And so when I was six, my brother's four years older. We were 10. He's, he was 10. Um, supposedly my father, uh, he was out and he was caught with another woman at a restaurant, and as a six-year-old little kid, my mom loaded us up to go and investigate if this was true or not. We loaded up in a little Datsun pickup truck. Anybody remember Datsun? I see some smiles back there. All right, cool. By the way, for you young people, it was, it was Nissan before Nissan. So it's a really small, tight truck. It's like I, I probably could fit both my arms out of both windows. But anyway, so... We, we got into this truck in a four-speed, and I actually had to straddle the gear shift, and my brother was to the right. We headed to this restaurant, and we, we actually saw my dad with another woman. And it broke my mom. It broke my mom. She's hours away from her home where she grew up in Louisville, Mississippi, and it was really late, and so we go back to our apartment. We start packing up our things. I had no idea what was going on. I was a six-year-old kid. And my brother just kept telling me about how his friends knew about this word divorce and that we're about to have two homes. And my, my brother, he had this thing he used to do where he wringed his hands a lot. He was very nervous. So we loaded up the bags that we could. We couldn't pack up much to be in the cab. We started to head to Mississippi. And my mom, she was trying her best to hold on emotionally, just to keep from breaking down. You, you wives who are in here, you moms, you know exactly where this is. The, possibly even this feeling of when you just, man, you got to be strong for your kids. And we didn't grow up in a, in a Christian home. So we're headed, we're headed on the interstate, and as we're headed on the interstate, uh, the windows started to fog up from my mom breathing so hard. And the defroster didn't work in the truck. So we had to roll the windows down. And all of a sudden, the rain started coming. And as the rain started to beat down on this little truck, my brother started to roll his window up, and my mom told him he had to leave it down to keep the windows from fogging up. We're still headed down, and all of a sudden, the windshield wipers go out. And she was still trying to hold on. You could feel it in the truck. My brother, I remember seeing his little hands. He was just wringing his hands. And shortly thereafter, the lights go out in the truck. It's really late at night. We pass under this overpass. And as we get under this overpass, I remember my mom for the first time doing something I had never seen her do. See, she actually grew up in a home where her parents did go to church. I had never even seen anybody pray. Now, I remember my mom getting out of the truck and getting as far away from us as she could. I remember her getting on her knees 
and I remember her talking to someone. There was, there was no one there. And I asked my brother, I said, Bill, what is she doing? He said, I think she's praying. I said, well, what is that? He says, well, you know, Papa, talking about her dad, he, when he prays over the food or says the blessing, that's prayer. He's ta- she is talking to God. I said, what is that? Well, how would that be? What would that sound like? What would that be like to communicate with the Creator? And I remember watching her as she did this old truck pulled up, had mud all over it, and this really tall black man got out with cover overalls on, and, and he told her as she got up and she exploded off the ground and she began to wrap herself around him, and he was trying to calm her down and tell her how crazy of a place this was to break down. How just the week before, there had been a couple who had been murdered and they were still trying to find their bodies. And he told her, ma'am, you need to get in that truck. She says, I can't. She was trying to talk. She says, I can't. And he told her just to get in the truck and he would look at it. So he popped the hood and my brother and I were trying to look underneath the hood to see what he's doing. And he pulled on this or that or whatever. It turned out the fuses were blown. And he told her to try the headlights, the wipers, everything came on immediately. And she busted out of the truck and he began to, she began to hold, hug him. He told her, he says, man, I want to tell you something. I would not have stopped. But I heard audibly, God tell me to stop. And I want to tell you, whatever you're going through, there's a redeemer. His name is Jesus Christ. And she said, he said, ma'am, I just want to pray for you. So he began to pray over my mom. And even as a six-year-old kid, you could feel the supernaturalness of the presence of this man of God. As he began to pray and speak specifically to things my mom was going through right then and there, and she had not even confessed those things to God. We get in the truck and we're driving and my eyes are like this because I have I know this is something just incredibly awesome. He passes us, and it looked as if he were staring right into my soul. I just reflect on that story as I studied, and Joe called me to look at this chapter in Ruth 3 of the sovereignty of God. That's what we're going to look at this morning, the sovereignty of God. Of God, the sovereign hand of God is so awesome and so incredible at times. It makes me break down and weep. So, with the time that I have with you today, you, you, I know you guys have been walking through the book of Ruth. Today, we will look at this powerfully explosive book, this chapter that reveals the magnificent sovereignty. Of God. So we will be in Ruth 3. So let us just dig in the text and let the Lord reveal to us what He's wanting to hear, what He's wanting us to hear this morning as the message is entitled, When Humility Meets the Feet of the Redeemer. So let us just read chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother in law, talking about Ruth's mother in law, said to her, My daughter, Shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now, is not Boaz our kinsman, with whose maid you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Verse 3, which we will spend a lot of our time in. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, And go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be with it it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies. You shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. Verse 5. Ruth is saying this. She said to her, All that you say. I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. 
when Boaz had eaten and drunk, his heart was merry. And he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. She came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. And it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled. And he bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Verse 10. Then he said, May you bless, be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will, I will do for you whatever you ask. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Now it is true. I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Remain this night. And when morning comes, if he will redeem, if he will redeem you, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. Verse 14. So she lay at his feet until morning and rose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Again, he said, give me that cloak that is on you, and hold it. So she held it and measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did it go, my daughter? And she told her all that he, the man had done for her. And she said, These six measures of barley he gave for me. For he said, Do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Verse 18. Then he said, then she said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. Very recently, I was in conversation with a brother who was struggling with his place in the Lord. And there's telltale signs of things that personally, when you are struggling with your walk and you feel that there's a distance between you and the Lord, I first want to ask you, have you been in communion with him? Have you been in fellowship? Have you been in his word? And as we started to talk about these things, he revealed that he had not been in the word. He had not been in the scriptures. He had not allowed the scriptures to bathe him, to expose things. So as a father and as a husband, as we both were, I asked him, how would it be if his wife, told him she could not physically be or would not physically be intimate with him for four months. He began to tell me that would be really tough. And I said, you know, why it's tough is because every man wants to be wanted. Your husband wants to be wanted, and the Lord is no different. He wants to be wanted. I want you to keep that thought in mind as we walk through this passage. In this text, we see Naomi, whose name in Hebrew means my delight or the lovable, prepare her daughter-in-law who desperately needed a kinsman redeemer. We see in this preparation, her tell her the first thing in verse 3, wash herself. In regards to the Jews, the law of Moses required ceremonial washing taking a bath, and the changing of the clothes to prepare for a special and a significant event that was to come. As a matter of fact, Naomi was telling Ruth to prepare, essentially, for a wedding. But what are the implications for us today? As New Testament followers of Jesus, what does or how does this apply to us? As far as the aspect of washing yourself, this is not a hygienic issue. But rather when we as followers of Christ in hopes to deepen our relationship with the Lord, there's something we, we must do ourselves. This text reveals to them, as you will see, there are many of us today who say that the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore. 
There's a Greek word for that. It's called baloney. The problem today is that most Christians, they don't, when they read through the scriptures of the Old Testament, they don't look at it through the lens of the cross. There are spiritual implications for us when we read and we study the Old Testament. We'll see this today. So in regards to wash yourself, some may point to Psalm 51, 2 and 7. You may want to write that down where we ask God to do as David asked God to do, to wash him or wash me. But this is not what Naomi is telling Ruth. She's saying, wash yourself. So this is not the same thing. There is work we must do. So what does the New Testament say in this regard? I asked our brothers to put some scriptures up. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Let us, as the NIV says here, purify. It is cleanse ourselves, wash ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We come into the presence of God and we expect him to work the supernatural when we haven't even confessed the sin in our life that has not been exposed. The Holy Spirit has put his finger on these things and yet and still we don't, we're not in obedience. Paul says in this text to cleanse, to purify, to wash ourselves. It is an act that we must do. The next text, John 13, 10. This is the Last Supper. So all the disciples are coming in. Jesus is about to start washing their feet. And one thing that I've come to realize is that Peter, he has what I call trigger mouth. He likes to pull the trigger real quick. So when Jesus explains to him how important it is for him to wash his feet, Peter says, well, then you can just wash my whole body. And Jesus then replies this way. Those who have had a bath, need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you who are clean, though not every one of you. Who is he talking about specifically? Not every one. There was one who was with them that had not been bathed. It was Judas. Therefore, we must wash ourselves. Why? Because to, in this time that we're in, we will be walking in the world, and we're going to get the world between our toes. We're going to be exposed to things that I often call it like, how many of y'all know what a, a cocoa burn, I think it is? You walk in the woods, and, and they stick to your clothes, and like you don't even know they're on you until you get home, and, and your wife or somebody says, man, what is this all on you? You have to literally pull those things off because they actually drop seeds where you are. As we walk and, tra and, and travail through the world, we're going to pick up trash on our feet. In this, Jesus is saying, you need to, your feet need to be washed. These are just the ideas that you need to come and confess those things to the Lord. James 5.16 is a text like this. We need to confess those things to him and to brothers and sisters so that these things will be in the light. Because I promise you, if you don't do this, your sin will find you out. It'll grow and it'll grow and it'll grow. So there's a response that we must do. Naomi was telling Ruth to get back into communion, to deepen. So this is what this is. We must do this to, with Christ. The second thing, anoint yourself. A bride, and I love this illustration what this means in the Hebrew. A bride would in this time period, she actually would, would take a, a fragrant oil and she would anoint herself. And it let people know two things. It let people who, who were not her husband know she belongs to him. And it let her husband know she belongs to me. You just think about the spiritual implications to that statement. So if Christy, back in that time, she would anoint herself, it would let me know she's mine. I could smell her. And it would let other men know she belongs to Brian Thrasher. Naomi was preparing Ruth to put 
this on to show she was about to belong to Boaz. For us as New Testament followers, anointing ourselves speaks to the working of the Holy Spirit's influence in our life. So how can we, quote, anoint ourselves and help aid him to influence us in our lives? 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Go to the next one, please. Like newborn babies, they crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Verse 3. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. We as followers of the Lord, if we want to produce this fragrance, this oil, we want to be anointed. The Lord is very, he's very specific about this. The Holy Spirit breathed this word. Theonoustos is a big five dollar word. It means the, it is God's breath on the pages. The pages are still wet from the dew from his mouth. They are still wet today. And if you want to grow in your relationship with the Lord to produce this fragrance, as we'll look at what this means in the New Testament for us, you have to be in his word. I love how Paul puts this in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 through 17. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ. There's the, there's the picture, the illustration. It allows God to know they belong to my son. Among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. The next one. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. So to outsiders, to people that do not know Jesus, it will be an aroma of death. To the other, an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Paul speaks here of the aroma or the fragrance of Christ that we can put out. And then it points to the fact that us not being peddlers we just don't talk about the Word. We live the Word. In order to live the Word, you must be immersed in the Word. As D.O. Moody once said, all Bibles should be bound in shoe leather. That means that we may be the only Jesus that some people will ever see in their life. Are you walking out the fragrance of him whom you say you're engaged to, him whom you say you're married to, the bridegroom. Are you walking this out? I'll tell you just quick a story. I know our youth in college that's back there, they know this guy. My son knows this guy. My wife and I knows this guy. I remember when I was lost, the first person that I smelled this from was a guy named Jason Green. He used to work at the hospital with my wife. And I remember seeing Jason walk down the hallway. And I was lost. And I just wanted to get as far away from that guy as I possibly could. Because he produced this aroma. But for me, it was a stitch of death. I wanted to get it as far away from me as I possibly could. Until one day, I came to salvation. And now, I cannot get enough of my brother. Why? Because now it's a fragrance of life. The same image is there. Are you giving off this aroma? Are you giving this off with the people at your job? For you students at, the, at your school, co-workers, friends, family members, are you giving, are you emanating this off? Or are you not? I promise you, if you feed yourself this word, Without a shadow of a doubt, if you study and you pray and you ask the Lord, Lord, expose things in my life that are hidden through your word. I promise you, it will be evident. The third thing in this text, she says, to put on your best clothes. 
In this text, we see Naomi again giving further instruction on how to prep for what we will see as Joe sees this next week and walk through the rest of Ruth, a life-changing event. This is life-changing not just for Ruth, but for Naomi. As she's preparing this, as she gets ready to meet Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, she was about to take off the garments of a sorrowing widow and dress for a wedding. In all honesty, Ruth probably didn't have a lot of clothes. But she had one special garment. Based on Jewish teaching, she probably had one special garment that was specifically for festive occasions. Naomi had faith the kinsman, Redeemer, would take her to be his and that she was preparing Ruth, her daughter-in-law, for this wedding. Clothes for us. The Bible in the Bible, clothes sometimes has a significant spiritual meaning. After Jesus called out Lazarus from the grave in Scripture, it says that he had his grave clothes on. He had his grave clothes still on. He was bound and gagged. He had a gag in his mouth and he was bound up, probably hopping around, which I'm not going to try to do. And in those clothes, he was unable to perform the duties that Christ had called him to do. Many of us today, as followers of Jesus, are just like Lazarus in that picture. You still have your grave clothes on. We still have those clothes on, and unfortunately, we don't want to take them off. As there's a song that, that uh, I'm familiar with, it says that the chains are broken, but they're comfortable to hold. The hurts and the hang-ups in your life that you don't want to let go, bitterness, anger, self-doubt, self-pity, pride, these things have been broken. And yet and still it's comfortable for us to hold them because we had them on before we were slain on the cross. We are still walking around carrying those things. Yet still, we're not bound in those things. We won't set those things down. We still have those grave clothes on. And because we still have them on, they're comfortable. We say that they're comfortable, and that is a dangerous place to be. Another set of clothes and garments we need to look at as New Testament followers as we see the spiritual implications of this passage is the clothes of righteousness. I want to ask you this morning, whose righteousness do you have on? Whose righteous garments do you have on? If they're yours, you might want to think about being obedient to this text where you need to change those garments because the bridegroom Jesus will have none of yours as Scripture says, they are like, and we love saying this, they're like filthy rags. Many of us have heard this phrase. Now, I don't want to get too graphic. This morning, do you guys know what that statement means? What it implies, filthy rags? That means that your righteousness, according to God, that you have wore your garments of righteousness are the equivalent to a woman's undergarments as she goes through her monthly menstrual cycle. If we are obedient to him and surrender fully to Jesus' way and seek to please him, then our garments will be white. Revelations 19, 8. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Clothed in his righteousness, salvation will produce works. Not because they're going to save you, because the Jesus in you will come out of your pores if you continue to feed him. This context is the marriage of the Lamb in the final book of the Bible. A pretty significant event. One that in this scene in Ruth that Naomi was hoping for with her daughter-in-law Ruth Boaz. But if our garments become stained by the sin in our life, like the washing that we just discussed, we must confess 
our sins before the Lord and before brothers and sisters as we seek his cleansing. All of this was to prepare Ruth to meet her future redeeming husband. And all this would be nothing if she did not do what's in verse 5. She said to her, so this is Ruth telling Naomi, all that you say, I will do. The application and inapplication is very important. The Bible and its ways are not a suggestion. They're not a suggestion. They're instructions from God so that we may be with him eternally. And the only way to become his son's bride is to do this. I love one of my favorite preachers, and I know Russell's not here, but his family is. He and I share this. There's a guy named Leonard Ravenhill. He says that one day, some simple soul is going to pick this book up. He's going to read it cover to cover. He's going to believe every single thing in this book. And we, we as, as supposed God's people, we will feel stupid. Because the Bible is not meant to be ex just to be explained. The Bible is meant to apply to your life. It's not a suggestion just to say, well, I could do this. No, if you follow the Lord, you will. You will do this. In this scene, Ruth submits to Naomi's teachings. When we look at this, don't just look at this as Naomi just preparing her for marriage, but as New Testament believers, I want you to look at it in this. Literally, it is a disciple leader training a disciple. Acts, or as we look at this, verse 6 through 9, we see Ruth approach the feet of her kinsman redeemer with humility. It says, so when... So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her to do. So that's obedience. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of the grain. And she came secretly and uncovered his feet. And she lay down, and it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward. And behold, he said, Who are you? And she, she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over me, for you are a close relative. Four times in this chapter, there is the mention of feet. Ruth had fallen at the feet of Boaz in response to his gracious words, but now she was coming to his feet to propose marriage. When she asked him in this section to spread his covering, verse 9, over her, he did it, and culturally that statement implies here that the person covering the other is claiming them for their own. The spiritual implication for us in this text is that when we submit ourselves to Christ, we pleaded to him to cover us in his righteousness not in our own. In Genesis 3, after the fall, Adam and Eve sought clothing because they had knowledge of good and evil. And as they had tasted the fruit of the forbidden tree, that day in Eden, their shame drove them to seek the clothing of the world. But thank God that he sent his son Jesus, who came and clothed us in his righteousness. And like Boaz, he has made us his own. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. And it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid for you are a close relative. Verse 10. Then he said, may you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, which whether poor or rich. The Redeemer accepts the humble as they submit. And in these two verses, we see a beautiful scene where Boaz, almost similarly the way the, they, the youth just sang about how he, you know, man, the Lord just pursues us. Boaz has the ability to change Ruth's life, and he accepts her because she submitted to him. He wanted her just as she was. 
She came humble and ready to obey. And when we look at this passage, we should see that Christ has the ultimate power to change the lives of anyone who humbly approaches him and submits to him. The greatest miracle recorded in the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation is not the feeding of the 35,000 or casting out of the demons or healing the deaf, the blind, the lepers. Rather, the greatest miracle in all the scriptures is as it was sung in that song to make a foe, an adopted son. For literally the Spirit of God to indwell in us, and us who are evil and nasty and horrible, for us to be sons and daughters. As this process, this supernatural power resides within us, even as a six-year-old kid, as I told you, I knew there was something in this man. That was supernatural. We could go on and on in this text, and we could walk through the further images of Christ in this story, but to wrap this up, I want to ask you this. Have you done these things? Have you humbly submitted to Jesus to become his bride? Maybe you have. Maybe you're lacking in these other things. Where we, where we need to stay obedient in. I want to ask you, are your grave clothes still on? Your grave clothes still on. We're, we're, hump, we're bound and gagged as we walk through. You need to lay those things down at the feet of the, the Redeemer. Maybe your feet are dirty, and you need to wash your feet. This altar is open as Joe is going to come here in a minute. You can come here and you can submit these things before the Lord. Maybe, perhaps, maybe, just perhaps, you need to, you have not been obedient in, in studying the scriptures and in, in creating this fragrance that we talked about. The message of the gospel is simple, as the idea of this series is hope. There is hope in Christ, but, but, we must be willing and humbly approach him and be willing to do whatever he says, and not until then is there not hope. Without him being Lord, which this implies, he cannot be your Savior. I want to close with this. The last verse in this text, it, it, in this, it says 418b, uh, it says, the, For the man will not rest until he has settled this today. Today, he wants this to be settled here and now. Maybe you have not washed yourself. Maybe you have come before him today. You can make that right. Perhaps today you've not anointed yourself by feeding the script, yourself the scriptures, and you feel distance between you and the Lord because you know you've not spent time in his word. You know this. Perhaps you're struggling with your walk. You know that still you have worldly grave clothes on. I want to encourage you to come here. Put your best clothes on. Pursue him and the kingdom work. Father, I just want to pray, Father, over this opportunity that you have given me to be here, to come here before your beloved people. Lord God, may we submit to this, this passage, the spiritual implications of our life as, Lord God, we could come here, we could come to the foot of the cross because the ground is level. Lord God, you don't care what color we are, Lord God, or what we look like in our clothes, how much money we have. Lord, because the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Lord God, you are awaiting us to come to your feet. And Father, I pray, Lord God, that oh, there are those here who will respond in obedience. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.